the Gospels, and、um, when we read the Bible, especially in the Gospels, we need to close the gap between our modern experience, this life that we know of today, and the and the accounts that we read of in Scripture. There are some contexts and conversations. And items and metaphors and terminologies in Scripture that are period specific, and we do need to navigate that and interpret those things specifically. Particularly if, if、uh, the Bible, you know, mentions things like certain objects, articles of clothing, certain customs, we do need to kind of rightly divide the word to understand that that was a period specific things. But there are large portions of texts in Scripture that are actually meant to age very well. They're actually enduring, and in fact, they're timeless and. Just as relevant today as they've ever been, even the ones that we feel really uncomfortable reading. The mistake we often make is that we dismiss texts or scriptures that we we feel makes us feel really uncomfortable because we have a modern paradigm, and we kind of dismiss it as, "Oh, that's not for us today."、Um, we need to be able to come back to scripture and wrestle with it, and understand that some things are period specific. We need to contextualize that, but there, most of the Bible is as relevant today as it's ever been. Do I get a resounding amen? Even the ones that we're just gonna go, "Oh, that's a bit strange, isn't it?" So we're going to go to the book of Mark today, Mark chapter five, and we're going to go. It's the Gospel of Mark. This is just a genuine account, something that truly happened in Scripture. It accounts for Jesus, and it says this: They came to the other side of the sea, which is the Sea of Galilee, not a real sea; it's like a big lake, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So Gadarenes is this area that was this massive graveyard, right? Already, like. I'm going. Okay, where is this leading me? This is like my morning devotion. I'm like really sleepy. I've got my cup, my cup of decaf, which doesn't really wake me up. It's just placebo. And I'm reading this stuff, and he goes, "Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him." So this was a wild dude. And always, night and day, so twenty-four-seven, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, "What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me." For he said to him, "Come out of the man, unclean spirit." Then he asked him, "What is your name?" And he answered, saying, "My name is Legion, for we are many." Something's wrong here. You don't answer and tell people your name by using a plural. We are many, and also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding, or pigs were feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged Jesus, saying, "Send us to the swine that we may enter them." And at once Jesus gave them permission. What is going on here? Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand, and the herd. Ran, ran violently, or stampeded violently down the steep place, or the edge of the cliff, into the sea, and drowned in the sea. This is the weirdest thing I've ever read in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> There is no question. This is a freaky, weird, and altogether crazy manifestation of the power of Jesus. But I don't know if you know that there are a lot of things when it comes to Jesus,、uh, things that we actually don't understand. And today I want to teach you on the thought stewarding the encounter. Stewarding the encounter. It's important for us to understand that a lot of us can disconnect from scripture when we read it, particularly if it's something that we don't feel like we can relate to in our day and age. Now, I always encourage people that correct Bible exegesis. If you want to actually get the most out of scripture, is to insert yourself into the text. I have God has blessed me with a really good imagination, so I often imagine myself in the text. Right? I imagine myself being the thirteenth disciple. It's not biblical, but I imagine myself being that guy. Right, like I'm like the Klingon, like the thirteenth wheel. Right, I am now in this account in Mark chapter five, and we've arrived at the other side of the lake. I'm already traumatized. Why? Because if you read Mark chapter four, you understand that while they were sailing to go to the other side, which is now Gadarenes, the account that we read, there was a storm, and the boat was rocking. Right. The disciples thought they were gonna die. Now I'm I'm not like Peter and Andrew. They were like they're professional fishermen. I'm like an accountant by trade. So me and Matthew, the tax collector, would have been hanging off the side of the boat, hurling. Oh, we're already mildly traumatized by the seasickness. We get to the other side. There's no time to debrief. It's a lot. We get there. Suddenly, there's this guy. He's running out naked. He's bleeding. He's screaming, screaming. 
screeching this horrendous sound. This guy lives amongst the graveyards. And then Jesus asks him what his name was. He replies using a plural like description. He says, oh, we are legion. It's something out of a horror movie. It's freaky. Right? And then Jesus has a conversation with demons. To make matters worse, Jesus then says to the demons, well, if you want to go into these 2,000 pigs, you can. And then these 2,000 pigs get demon possessed and then they stampede off the edge of a cliff and they drown. What? Ew. If I was the 13th disciple, I would have completely freaked right out. This was like a lot. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I would have had to have had counseling after the encounter. I today want to teach you how to handle the a lot of Scripture. Because when we get to Scripture, there's often a lot of things that are beyond our capacity to handle it. When we read the text like we do in Mark chapter 5, when we, and we've inserted ourselves in the story, we need to do this thing that goes beneath the Scripture, go beyond what we see and experience and ask, God, what is it that you're doing here? How do we handle this crazy, the supernatural things in Scripture when our current reality is a daily consciousness of what is sensual and temporal and earthly? Like we're constantly aware of things like technology and science and apps and online and digital this and our present daily awareness is of cars and houses and traffic and shoes and clothes and cafe food and brushing our teeth and and jobs and tax returns and chores and washing and cleaning. We're told to trust the science. How do we navigate a supernatural God? Because if you remember, Christianity is a supernatural faith. How do we navigate the spirituality of our Christian faith versus the natural occurrences of what we see every day? When we read Scripture, it's the, the Logos, the written Word of God. How do we contend with our logic when our logic collides with Logos? What do we do? When we read scripture like this, how do we handle this? This is just crazy, Jesus. What is it with these demons entering into pigs and then they drown themselves and like this guy, like this guy screaming out of tombs? What is going on? I want to teach you today how to handle the a lot of the encounter, how to steward it. God did some incredible things at conference. And I know some of you would have seen and experienced some things that you may have never seen before or experienced before, either because you're new to the Christian faith or maybe you're part of it. You've grown up in a faith tradition or an upbringing that has been different to what you may have seen at conference. I want to bring some teaching and some leadership today to help you steward the a lot that often comes with the move of the Holy Spirit, with the outworking of the Holy Spirit, because we do need to understand that the predominant reality that everyone lives in is actually a spiritual reality, not an earthly one. You are a spirit being having a human experience. Your time as an earthly being is only finite, but your time as a spiritual being is eternal. i got to teach you how to handle the a lot. Of, of all that is going on. And uh, when we talk about being in a season of encounter, I need to give you some leadership on how to manage that, how to figure that out, and how to navigate the, the doubts and the cynicism, or, 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 you know, all the things, the emotions that come with that. And the first part of stewarding our encounter is this, that God is far less concerned about the manifestation than He is about your transformation. I need a resounding amen from you, church. God is far less concerned about the manifestation than He is about your transformation. When we read Scripture, there is little to no biblical rules around manifestation and how and why they happen. They just do. So many men and women far smarter than me through the ages have tried to figure it out, but maybe that's the point. Signs and wonders are there to remind us that we worship a supernatural God And the predominant realm is the spirit realm and not the earthly realm. Manifestations are recorded all over the Bible to simply remind us that we do not deal with things of flesh and blood. Come on, are you out there? That the devil is real, heaven is real, God is real, and the enemy is in the business of oppressing and tormenting humanity, but we have a victorious Savior, and we have authority in Jesus' name. And the manifestations are simply a sign to show us that God is at work. In case you're wondering why it's translated to that phrase, signs and wonders, whenever something happens that we don't understand, it's a sign to make us wonder at the reality of God. Understand that? So when we we don't know how to handle it, it becomes easy for us to dismiss it, but God is far less concerned about the manifestation than He is about your transformation. 
How do we know that? Because Jesus was prepared to sail across a stormy sea to set free one man. A man that society didn't want anything to do with. He didn't do it to create a spectacle. He did it to set a bound up man free. It's just that along the way, he just thought in his infinite wisdom, it would be an awesome idea to send demons into pigs to drown. I don't know what that's about. He just saw that it was necessary. And guess what? The early church fathers would have all read the original manuscript and thought, whoa, wow. Let's leave that in there in the canon of scripture. Right? And it passed the stringent test of that actually needs to be in the canon of scripture. Thank God they didn't sit around the, the council where they were, they were looking at what, what is going to be in the Bible and not and thought to themselves, well, I wonder whether there's going to be someone in Mount Pleasant in Perth in 2022 that's going to be a little bit freaked out by this. Let's remove that and give them a sanitized version of what. Come on. Thank God. The Bible tells it as it is and reminds us that we live in a supernatural world. Come on. I need a resounding amen. We don't know why Jesus stops and has conversations with demons. Don't know why. Jesus spits on mud, puts it on a blind man's eye. I don't know why he lets Lazarus stay dead for four days. Why not one? Why not two? Why not ten days? I don't know. Right? But the manifestation is not the goal. Your transformation is... Come on, in a resounding amen. amen. The manifestation is not the end goal. It is not, it's your changed lives. So fall forwards, fall backwards, don't fall. Shaking, laughing, crying, standing there like a stunned mullet. That's not the point. The point is this, are you letting God touch you so he can change you? That's the point. That's the question we all need to ask when we steward the encounter. Are we letting God touch us so He can change us? That is, is the only question we need to ask. Are you letting go of your cynicism? Are you letting it get out of the way so we can touch your life and heal you? Are you letting your religiosity get out of the way so God can do a deep work in you? Because at the end of the day, long after this demonized man at Gadarenes had forgotten about the crazy thing with pigs, he's going to go on walking in wholeness and freedom for the rest of his life. The manifestation is to simply show you that God is doing it and not man. Lest we thank our therapist, and I thank God for therapists, lest we thank the pill in the bottle, lest we thank human efforts. The signs and the wonders are to show you that God is deeply at work in your life and He's the only one who can truly bring transformation. And can I also say this too? Stop chasing spectacular manifestations. Stop pursuing the theater of it because that's not the heart of God. In fact, they cornered Jesus in Matthew chapter 16. The religious people wanted to feel superior. They wanted to see more theater of this, this man called Jesus. If you're really real, they said, on the day the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, demanding that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority, to which Jesus replied in verse 4, only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign because the Holy Spirit is not a spectacle. He's not a show. He's the power of God to change your life. And if all you're doing is chasing the euphoria of the, of the manifestation without the transformation of heart, then you're not on the same page as Jesus. Come on, I need a resounding amen. So let me set your heart at rest. God can do a work in you with or without a manifestation. If He feels it needs a manifestation to do it, let Him. And if He feels you don't need a manifestation to do it, don't manufacture it. Don't resist him and don't manufacture it. Come on. The second thing about stewarding our encounter is the other end of the spectrum of thinking is this. God is more concerned about touching a person's life than about how comfortable we are witnessing it. Because I would have been very uncomfortable witnessing this at the 13th disciple. I'm already seasick and now you've got like demons jumping into, into pigs and stuff like that. It's freaking me out, Jesus. I just I haven't had time to debrief. But we need to let God do what God wants to do to set a person free. If it means sailing, sailing across to the other side of the sea and doing all of that sort of stuff, so be it. Because I don't think Jesus cared how uncomfortable it made the disciples feel or even the pig farmers. Because if you actually read Mark chapter 5 in verse 14, it says the pig farmers actually fled. I would have fled too. It's free. Can you imagine 2,000 pigs and the noise of demonized pigs stampeding violently off the edge of a cliff and then drowning. If you thought what some of you, what you saw at conference was strange, you would have lasted two seconds with Jesus. There was some strange stuff happening all throughout scripture. What is with Jesus walking on water in John chapter 8? Spits 
on mud, rubs it in a dude's eye. In Mark chapter 7, there was a deaf and a mute man. Jesus thought, it would be a fantastic idea to stick my fingers in his ears and spit on his tongue. <laughs> what is with that? Acts chapter 9, right? The book of Acts chapter 9 accounts for a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus was like the, a zealot of, he was the most zealous zealot out there. He was like a religious Pharisee that was persecuting Christians. And he has an encounter with Jesus that literally knocks him off his feet, what we would call being slain in the spirit. He's on his back. This was a guy that prided himself on staying standing while Christians that he was persecuting were on their knees being stoned. Jesus knocks him off his feet. He's now flat on his back on the road to Damascus. He has an encounter with Jesus. No catcher. I can see all you lawyer types thinking, oh man, that is a lawsuit waiting to happen. No incident reports being filled whatsoever. Acts chapter 9 verse 7, it says, and the men, his entourage, the men who journeyed with Saul of Tarsus, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Three days, he was blind. Imagine having that kind of encounter. You'd be complaining to the church for sure. But the entourage was speechless. They didn't know what to do. Here is the Saul from Tarsus, and when he gets up, from, I don't know why Jesus chose to knock him off his feet and cause him to be blind and lose his appetite for three days. But that Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul the Apostle that writes two-thirds of the New Testament. Come on, are you out there? The book of Acts accounts for the odd occasion where they, they needed some kind of explaining for what was going on. When the Holy Spirit first fell on the early church, it was crazy. People were on the streets. They were speaking in other tongues, so much so that Peter... Imagine a fisherman having to explain chaos, right? He says, hold up, hold up, hold up. It's only the third hour of the day. These people are not drunk as you suppose. The Holy Spirit has come upon them. So there are times when these manifestations occur where we just don't know why or how it happens. But what I'm saying is this. It challenges my religiosity and my need for control. And there are times when we see and read and experience things that is illogical, it's unnatural, it's uncontrollable. It makes me feel uncomfortable, but God is far less concerned. <laughs> God is more concerned about touching a person's life than about how comfortable we are witnessing it. And if it means, see, see, what am I, what am I saying? I'm saying this, don't chase the weird and wacky, but don't be religious either. Yeah. Come on, are you out there? Yeah. Don't try and manufacture it and try and make it happen, but don't crush it and quash it either and dismiss it. Just do what God wants you to do. And it's on this third point of stewarding the encounter, simply this, pursue what's real. Come on, pursue what's real. When we say at Nation's Church, we're about the encounter, we are leading our people, you and I, need to pursue what's real and let God take care of the rest. The third part of stewarding your encounters, pursue what's real. Always ask yourself, am I pursuing intimacy with Jesus? Am I pursuing more of Him? Am I developing a hunger for Him? And, and am I developing a hunger for His reality? If you're pursuing what's real and you end up feeling like electricity is shooting through your body and you're shaking like a leaf or you're standing there like a stunned mullet, it doesn't matter because you're pursuing what's real. Come on, are you out there? You might be crying uncontrollably. You might be laughing uncontrollably. Yo, I don't know what, but don't you dare quench what is holy, but don't you manufacture what isn't real either. So having said all of this, my exhortation and encouragement to you in stewarding the encounter is simply this. Don't be religious, but don't be a weirdo either. Pursue what's real and allow what's real to take root in your life and manifest itself how Jesus sees fit. Helpful to you guys? All right. Well, we've had our encounter. What next, right? So we're going to go a little deeper. What next? I'm a really practical guy, so I'm going to give you some practical tools. Is that okay? You're going to get some meat and potatoes like home-cooked meal tonight. Is that okay? So you've had your encounter. God has touched you, He's healed you, He's set you free, He's delivered you, He's given you prophetic words, spoken, you into, spoken into your life. What next? The what next is so important. It will make or break what happens in the next steps of your journey. And the first thing that I always do whenever I've had an encounter with God, God's spoken a prophetic word over me, I've, I've sent something in God, He's done a shift in me, a transformation of sorts, set me free from something, is this. I check the soil of my heart. 
Check the soil of your heart. Luke chapter 8, Jesus talks about the different ways a person can receive something from God. God is the sower. There is an impartation. There is a deposit. There is a word. There is a vision. There is a calling. There is a purpose. Something. God is the sower. The receiver has to check the soil of their heart. Luke chapter 8, Jesus says that there are four different grounds or soils or conditions that decide what happens with what God has done in your life. And the first ground or soil is the wayside or the pathway ground. This is the resistant type of ground where the ground is so hard that the seed does not penetrate into it and the enemy comes and takes away all that the sower sows. In other words, like in the middle of an encounter, you're already doubting, you're already batting away. This can't be of God. This God is not for me. I'm not worthy. Is that resistant part of you that, that rejects out of hand the sowing of God into your life. Follow me so far. The second soil of your heart is the rocky ground where Jesus said, this is the kind of ground that is, is pretty shallow. Like it, it, it doesn't go deep. The, 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 the roots don't go deep. We receive the encounter with joy, but you don't really sit with it. You don't really meditate on it. You don't really stew on it. Like you, you've had your encounter with God and it's bang straight away. Like you, you flip, bang, you're out there having lunch. Just, just being silly all over again, right? So you, you just let it pass, and you just feel like, oh, it was nice. And the next time temptation comes, right, if you, you, you kind of just cave in again because you undo all that God did to set you free. Follow me so far. The third ground is the thorny ground, and that's like the cluttered or the busy ground. You know how you've had an encounter with God, and you have great intentions to kind of do something with what God has spoken to you about, but then come Monday, you all get busy again. You guys are getting real quiet. You guys get real busy again. It's back to business as usual. You clutter up your diary with stuff that doesn't really matter. And the, Jesus actually says this, that this thorny ground is when the seed is choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life. But then there's the fourth ground, which is the good ground. In Luke chapter 8, it says this, verse 5, But the ones that fell on the ground, on the good ground, are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it. That word keep it is to tend to. That, that word is like a bit of a gardener. How they would, I've never done this in my entire life, but how they would care, someone would care for a pot plant. I don't know how that works. I've seen it on YouTube. It's not worked for me so far, but I'm going to try it. We need to like, put it in a nice spot, water it, and fertilize it and stuff, and tend to it and things. This is what you do with your encounter. You keep it, and then it bears fruit with patience. You steward the encounter. By allowing your heart to be good soil, good ground, where you keep it, you tend to it, and over time, it'll bear the fruit that God intended for it to bear in your life. Any resounding amen? amen. The second practical, this, the second thing to do uh, when you're stewarding the encounter, what next, is to take practical steps. I'm a practical guy. You need to have practical steps. Just about every encounter in the Bible was followed by actionable steps by the person who had that encounter. This kind of blows out any kind of theology where you think that the encounter is for your euphoria. Yeah. The encounter is not so you can feel good, but it's to put a plan in place for your life. Moses didn't have a burning bush experience just so he could tell people about the burning bush and feel awesome about it. The burning bush sent him back to Egypt. He had to take actionable steps, right? Every encounter that people had, Saul from Tarsus, when he was knocked on his off his feet and on the ground, he had an encounter with Jesus. He didn't just get up and thought, this, that was pretty, that was an awesome experience. I feel good about myself. He changed his whole identity to become Paul the Apostle. He spent three years in Arabia, out of sight of anyone learning Scripture. Come on, are you out there? Take actionable steps. We think about Acts chapter 16, right? This was the account of the Philippian jailer who had put Paul and Silas in jail for evangelizing the city of Philippi. So Paul and Silas are now beaten, they're stripped naked, they've been chained hand and feet in the inner dungeon. That night at midnight, they start praising and worshiping and the whole prison starts to shake. I've never been in an earthquake, but I hear it's terrifying. How many of you have ever been in an earthquake? Yeah, a few of you, I hear it's terrifying. This was not like, like, like just really low down on the Richter scale. This was like legit where all of the prison doors flung open. Prison walls shook. Chains rattled and fell off people's, all the prisoners' hands and feet. Now, that will freak anyone out, right? The Philippian jailer falls on his feet, <clears throat> on his knees, and says to Paul and Silas, what do I need to do to get saved? He has an encounter with Jesus that night. And then it says this in verse 22, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him. So Paul and Silas spoke the word of the Lord to the jailer and to all 
who were in his house, and he took them the same hour, that same night, and he washed their stripes, did something practical, took practical steps, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food. It was the first hospitality team of the Philippian church right here. He set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. He took practical steps. I reckon Paul and Silas would have found a way, Ty, to do a life found course with him, like, and his family, told him about Jesus, told him about the Holy Spirit, got them baptized with water. They took practical steps. I don't know what God has done in your life across this last season of encounter, but you need to start taking some practical steps. Are there apps on your phone you need to delete? Are there websites you need to cancel off your search engine? Are there TV shows? Are there things that you need to unsubscribe? Is it like setting an, going to bed half an hour earlier and setting your alarm half an hour earlier to wake up and spend time with God? It's not very popular, is it? We like the spectacular. We don't like the practical steps that sustain the encounter, right? Do you need to have a conversation with someone and say you're sorry? Do you need to offer forgiveness? Do you need to reconcile and restore? Do you need to do a life-found course and actually fill in those gaps and go, oh, man, I've been coming to church for 20 years, but I, truth be known, my foundations are really weak. Do something about it. Can I go a little deeper with you? For those of you that have received a prophetic word, how many of you have ever received a prophetic word? I'm going to teach you how to steward the prophetic word because it's very important what you do when God actually speaks to you. I want to just spend a minute or two teaching this. Stewarding prophetic words are very important because prophetic words in intent are always meant to be inspirational and directional in terms of their purpose for your life. They're meant to inspire you and they're meant to direct you. Say inspire, inspire. and direct. direct. Prophetic words are never meant to condemn you. So if you ever feel condemned, that's not from God. Yeah. It's never meant to make you feel inadequate or pull you away from the house of God or the heart of God. If you ever feel yourself tempted because of a prophetic word to pull away from community and the house of God and his heart, that is not from God either. They're meant to inspire you to a higher calling and purpose in God and give you direction. But what prophetic words do not do is to fulfill the prophecy for you. And you're going, what? A prophetic word's intention is never to fulfill the prophecy for you. You need to take practical steps in obedience with God to walk along the journey with God in order to see His prophetic utterance over your life fulfilled. So many people go to be with the Lord without ever seeing prophecy fulfilled over their life. Why? Because they just thought that it would just be fulfilled for them. Can I teach you this? Very, very simple, right? Getting a prophetic word and not taking any small practical steps to outwork in obedience what God wants you to do. It's like, for example... You know that you need to be at 8 Playl Street, Myrie. For those of you that are watching online, that is the campus that we're filming this from and, and, and streaming live to you from. So you know that you need to get to 8 Playl Street, Myrie. And maybe you say you're living somewhere in Perth like, like Malaga or Osborne Park or Nolamara or Canning Vale or Piero Waters or Armadale, right? You're on your couch and you go, okay, I need to get to 8 Playl Street, Myrie. I don't know how to get there. So what do you do? You get your Maps app out, don't you? You punch in 8 Playl Street, P-L-A-Y-L-E, Myrie, M-Y-A-R-E-E. -E, right? And you hit directions, right? And then it even like zooms in and go, oh, oh, that's where, oh, that's where I need to get to. And then it even tells you the time and how many kilometers. And then you continue sitting on your couch in your bathrobe, getting disappointed days, weeks, months, years as to why Myri campus hasn't come to you. Do you get that? The prophetic word is meant to inspire you and direct you. What do you need to do once you've got the location and the direction? You need to actually get out of your bathroom. I know that's a big deal for some of you, getting out of your uri in the mornings. But you need to do it, right? Shower, right? Do your hair. I skipped that part this morning. Get in the car. Turn the engine on and start driving the only way that you can get to where the destination intended for you is is to actually take the steps so many of us feel disappointed when God has inspired and directed us and we've done nothing and feel disappointed in God that he hasn't brought eight Playl Street to our door when all along we're meant to walk towards it you following me so far take practical Steps over the years of ministry, I've seen people go, oh, you know, God spoke to me about doing this years ago and doing that for him years ago. I'm still waiting. Well, have you taken the steps that you need? No, not really. 
My favorite one is when, when people speak, when God speaks to people about serving Him with all their lives, and maybe even there's a prophecy on full-time ministry and, or just getting out on the mission field, and, 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 and they feel disappointed. It's like, it's like oh, do you know, I, I, thought, I thought this was going to happen. You asked a mate, you, you, well, what's on your life? Well, you know, God spoke to me about, uh, about going to the mission field or, or, or leading people. Or I, I feel God's called me to be in full-time ministry. Bro, you struggle to go to connect once a fortnight. You struggle to lead 10, 12, 15 people as a connect leader. What makes you think you can lead thousands for years, right? We have these grandiose, spectacular things God speaks to us about, but we refuse to take the practice. Come on, are you out there? We refuse to wash the stripes, feed people food, and we wonder why revival doesn't come. Come on. We like the spectacular, but we don't like the practical. I remember a season in my life where I loved being an accountant. It was a good season in my life. Loved it. It was a season where I had a, an office on Adelaide Terrace that, <clears throat> you know, I could see the river. From, it was just really great. I was a young accountant coming up, and I had dreams. And God, it was a season there where God was, was really, through prophetic words, were telling me that I was exactly where He wanted me to be. So that's my trajectory, right? And then all of a sudden, things started to change. About sort of towards the end of 1999, it was like my world just got crazy. It was like these random prophets would come and, 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 and pull me out of, of crowds and just tell me like I was going to pastor people and stuff. I had no ambition to do any of the things I'm doing right now. I'm still looking for it. Like, but I had, like, was no grit for it. There was no grit for it. And like, this, this, these guys from America would come in and like, they, they would say this stuff about like, you know, you're going to be in, in, in full-time ministry. And like, what? It's like, I'm doing my CPA, God. Do you understand? Do you understand how many student loans I have? I've racked up a lot of hex debt. Right? But, God just began to speak, and I just, I didn't know what to do with it. A spiritual father of mine just said, Ken, just take practical steps with no agenda. And so I thought, okay, well, I was like worship leading once every, every couple of weeks. I just thought, I want to roster myself on every week. I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm, I've, got, I've got time on my hands after work. What, I'm gonna, what am I going to do? I'm going to take on a life group. One of my ex-life group members is actually here, and um, <clears throat> we call it connect groups now. It was crazy back in those days. I had no idea what I was doing, but I did it anyway. Right? I just took practical steps to just do all of the things that I needed to do to serve Him with no agenda. Oh, the reason for that is well, maybe, I just thought to myself, maybe, just maybe, if whatever it is that God spoke on my life was actually to come to pass, I didn't want to be pantsed and un, unprepared for it. I was going to do what I needed to do to take the small steps. If it never gets fulfilled, that's not my business, but I'm going to take the small steps that are required to steward the encounter. The reason why Ultimately, and I'm going to land this, that we need to steward the encounter is simply this, that every encounter always leads to purpose. Every encounter always leads to purpose. Think about it for a second. We don't know why, Mark chapter 5. Jesus, why would you even talk to demons? Why would you even give them what they asked for, which is going to go into pigs? <laughs> it's a waste of bacon if you ask me. <laughs> Have you seen the price of pork lately? Legit, Right? 2,000 pigs off the edge of a cliff. See you later. Gone. Right? That is a lot of crackling. A lot of good crackling. Do I any pork lovers in the house? Oh, man. Roast pork belly with a crispy skin. Gooey layer of fat. Then the meat. Really salty on top. Chinese five slice pan on the bottom. Oh, man. Noodles or rice. It doesn't matter. It's just, just load it on there. It's a waste. 2,000 pigs. I don't know. You know? <clears throat> it would be easy for us to kind of go, okay, that was a spectacular encounter, spectacular manifestation. Great. He got his freedom. That's great. Fantastic. We were happy to leave it at that and go, well, Jesus heals and sets people free. Oh, yeah, that's enough to write a song about. It's amazing, right? But it doesn't end there because it says in Mark 5 verse 18, and when he, being Jesus, got into the boat, he's now back in the boat wanting to sell back, right? He who had been demon-possessed, begged him that he might be with him. In other words, Jesus, I want to cruise with you. This was so awesome. This experience, this encounter was so good. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. There was purpose after the encounter. I need a resounding amen. There's a reason why Jesus meets with you, heals you, sets you free, knocks you on your back, makes you quiver. I don't know. 
right? Or makes you stand still. It doesn't matter. But the reason why is because He wants to set you on your course to your purpose. And most of us would have thought, oh man, this, this, this is really, really great and, and, and this is really exhilarating. Just like this guy who was set free. Jesus, can I come with you? Can I roll with you? The euphoria of this. Man, I want to keep repeating this. This is too cool. Can you do it again, God? But Jesus said, no, I want you to go back to your home. Tell all your friends. Tell them, become the evangelist I've called you to. And then it says, he began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And all marvels, say all. all. Decapolis. Decapolis is not a town. Decapolis was a blanket term to describe 10 cities. Deca, metropolis. 10 cities. Catch this. We see the crazy manifestation, Right? But Jesus knew all along from the moment he said to his disciples, boys, we're going to get into a boat and we're going to sail across the other side. So much, oh my gosh, so much to debrief, so much has happened. Like the storm, crazy, Jesus sleeping in the boat, calms the storm, where is your faith? Gets to the other side, ah, screaming, like, you know, talks to the demons, pigs, edge of a cliff, wasted bacon, the whole thing, right? Easy for us to get caught up in all of the stuff. What Jesus had in mind was that this guy who was demonized at the other end of this boat trip was set free. Damascus, Opaton, Philadelphia, Rafana, Scythopolis, Gadara, Hippondian, Pella, Galassa, and Kanatha all heard the gospel because purpose always comes after your encounter. I wonder if there's people in the room where you've dismissed the outward works of God because it's just a little freaky. You've dismissed it as not God. You've judged it. You've maybe shaken a little bit, felt something in God, but you, you just dismissed it. This is too weird. It's not how I was brought up. And you've missed out on going to your Decapolis. Or maybe some of you here have been frustrated that God hasn't brought the, the fruit out of waiting in your encounter, so you make it, you make things happen. You, you, you search for the theater of it. You search for the euphoria of it. Neither is the heart of God. Just pursue what's real. Walk in practical steps to steward your encounter. And the time is going to come where you will be led into all of the purpose that God has in store for you in Jesus' name. I need a resounding amen. Musicians, you can join me. Is that helpful to you guys? Come on, stand to your feet right across this room. My time is up. My time is up. This is what I want to say. The power of God is real. Don't you ever forget that heaven is real. Hell is real. Angels are real. Demons are real. The supernatural realm, even though we can't see it because we're so conditioned to deal in tactile, sensual things in the here and now, it's all real. What am I asking you to do? When I'm asking you to steward the encounter, I'm asking you to either set aside religion and logic and reason and pursue what's real or to stop chasing the theater and manufacture it when it's not really happening and pursue what's real. At the end of the day, it's your personal encounter with Jesus that matters and the course that He has set for your life. That's why He meets with you. That's why your spirit leaps when we talk about things that are of God. Something inside of you resonates. If you can see past the religion or see past the crazy, you need to understand that Jesus wants to do something very real in your life today. And so now with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to invite anyone who's maybe never had that first experience of inviting Jesus into their lives, opening up your heart to Him, or maybe you know you've wandered away from Him. And today you know that you're far from God. <clears throat> and if you were to be honest, you're not really sure of what your eternal destiny is going to be. Friend, the only way that you can be assured of life beyond the grave is through Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and you're tired of doing life on your own. Sick of trying to figure it out. Do it in your own strength. But today you're saying, yeah, I want to open my heart up to you, Jesus. I don't understand everything, but you're kind and you're merciful and you're gracious and you're loving. 
you need to know there's a safe place for you online and in the room to make this decision. I'm going to count to three. All you need to do is simply slip your hand up so I can see who you are and pray with you right where you're standing. No one's looking around except myself and the leader at the back to help me see you so I can acknowledge you. You want to say yes to Jesus or you want to recommit your life to Him? Do so now. One, two, three. Quickly put your hand up so I can see who you are. Is that you today? I see that hand over there, man. Well done, brother. So good. Anybody else? Who's going to join this really courageous man? Anybody else? You want to say, yeah, that's me. I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm not asking you to do anything religious. It's nothing like that. You just make a decision today that will forever change the trajectory of your life. Anybody else? The Bible says if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that He is Lord, you'll be saved. So we're all going to say this prayer together. Online, if you're responding, log on to nationschurch.com forward slash my decision. We love to journey with you, but you pray this prayer with us too. (coughs) Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died and you rose again for me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and wipe away all of my past. And Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. And I thank you that from this moment on, I'm a new creation and have a new future in you, in Jesus' name. And everyone said. Thank you, God. So good. Bro, God loves you so much, man. I've seen you and there's a call of God on your life. It's a great decision you've made and really pray that their prayers helped you. Someone's going to come to you, give you a Bible, pray with you at the end of the service. Nothing weird, nothing freaky, but you know what? It's been a great morning for you and we just know that God has a great future and a plan for your life, eh? To everybody else, just bow your heads for a moment. I just really get a sense that there's people in the room Well, you've been held back from your Decapolis. You need to know that Jesus would sail across the sea for you. There are things that have held you back, maybe your preconceived ideas, maybe fears, maybe the deep work of the Holy Spirit to set you free. Others here, you're frustrated with God. There are things that has been spoken over your life that have not been fulfilled and you've tried to make it happen in your own strength. All I'm asking you today is to hunger for what's real and let Jesus do the work. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. If you're here today and you know in your heart of hearts you're not walking in the fullness of all that Jesus died and rose again for you to do, their purposes and callings and things and places to go, people's lives to touch and experiences to have that you're yet to have because of some hesitancy, some barrier. Or maybe you're carrying frustration as to the fruitlessness of, of, of the grind a little bit and, and you're getting weary in the patience. I want you to lift your hands right across this room because Jesus is gonna give you a fresh grace. The capitalist is waiting for so many people. Those 10 cities would have missed out on what this man had for them. Had the disciples been real all cynical and thought, man, this is too freaky, the, the pigs thing off the edge of the cliff. Jesus, can we sail back? Can you just stop? But Jesus was far more concerned about what was at the other end of all of this. And the signs and the wonders and the manifestations were simply to point to a supernatural God that is at work in your life. The greatest tragedy for every believer is to encounter Jesus and still stay living amongst the tombs. Every eye looking to Jesus this morning, if that is you, I want to just invite you to come and worship right up the front. Don't respond to me, but respond to the Holy Spirit just to say, I want to take the steps in obedience for whatever it is that you've spoken in my heart. As we sing this song, you come quickly. I want to pray with you. Come, come, come.